Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Ellsberg. I'm sorry I couldn't be there with you in person today, but I'm happy to be able to talk about what was going on in 1967, which was that we were in a stalemated war, a stalemated imperial war, as we are today in Afghanistan. I'll get back to that. But I'd come back understanding, like nearly everyone in Vietnam, that the war there was thoroughly stalemated, that there had been essentially no progress in the previous year, despite the fact we'd added more than 100,000 more troops. And there was no prospect for any progress in any sort at that point. Now, I hadn't read the Pentagon Papers' uh, history of the United States' involvement in Vietnam from 1945 to 1968. I finished reading that in early 1969, almost two years later. And at that point, I understood that what is the theme of the Burns movie about series about Vietnam, uh, as they say at the beginning, that it was begun in good faith by decent men uh, with some miscalculations and so forth. I understood when I'd read the early part of the Pentagon Papers that that had never been true, that the lying uh, had proceeded from the uh, regime of the administration of Harry Truman right on through Lyndon Johnson, four presidents, and that it was happening again under a fifth president. And that the idea that more troops would lead to more progress was untrue then, as it is this week, as I talked to you, when the general motel in charge in Afghanistan is saying that uh, more troops there, more advisors, will put us on the path to progress. He's not even promising victory. He's admitting, as this time, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, General Dunford, has admitted we are stalemated, which means that men, we are sending men and women over there to kill and to die for no purpose, that is no legitimate purpose of the United States or anyone else. These are wasted lives. Now, when, on October, uh, 1967, I was working on the Pentagon Papers right at that time, doing a study of the 1961 decision-making, which had perplexed me ever since it was announced in 1961, because I had been in Vietnam just a month earlier and had heard from all the advisors there that there was no progress to be had there. So I was very surprised when President Kennedy said that more advisors of the kind we're hearing right now for Afghanistan, that more advisors to the local troops there uh, would uh, possibly win, and nothing more was needed. That was a lie by the president. He'd been told by General Maxwell Taylor, then about to be chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, that there was no progress to be made unless we put in American combat troops. Now, that was true as far as it went. Uh, without the combat troops, uh, there was no hope for the U.S. to achieve its objectives. We did put in more than 500,000 combat troops, and we were no closer to achieving those objectives a few years later. Uh, I don't think they're about to do that in Afghanistan. They've learned the lesson. Do it with drones, which didn't exist then. Do it with American air power. Don't have American casualties. And the American public will put up with killing any number of local people, uh, brown people, in this case, Afghans, in that case, uh, Vietnamese. American people can, can live with killing any number of those people in pursuit of what the president thinks of as his objectives or our objectives, mainly his not being accused of losing the war. Uh, and to do that, as I say, any number of foreigners uh, may be killed. In October, I knew that of 1967, after two years in Vietnam, in which I visited almost every uh, province in Vietnam. I think there were 43 provinces. I'd been in like 41 of them. And uh, knew that there was uh, no progress. During the march, which I marched from the Lincoln Memorial to the Pentagon with other people, in hopes that it would contribute to shortening the war, to ending the war, to getting us out of Vietnam, as, as everybody else thought in that. My future wife uh, was in that crowd, but we didn't meet at that time. My brother was in it, uh, and we did meet. And he said, how will anybody believe there were 25,000 people here when I tell them that I met, ran into my brother? 
in the course of the crowd. Anyway, after seeing marshals beat on the heads of uh, young people, men and women, being thrown into uh, paddy wagons, uh, a sight that makes an American's blood boil when you understand that these are people who have no criminal intent or action and are being brutalized by marshals who I understood at the time were brought up from the South for this purpose, actually. Anyway, uh, I then went into the Pentagon with my Pentagon pass because I was working on the Pentagon papers as a consultant from the Rand Corporation. And because the view wasn't so good there uh, from the office we were working in, I went next door to Secretary of Defense McNamara's office. And uh, to my surprise, in, a, in an almost empty building that Saturday, he was there too. And I jumped back a bit and I was ready to leave. And then I thought, well, he knows me. And he's not saying anything. So I went to the window and watched it with him. Now, I had had a long session with him uh, a couple of months earlier, in which he'd made it clear that he shared my view that the war was not only stalemated, was going to remain stalemated and uh, had no prospect of progress. Uh, what I didn't know was that in October, uh, just before this event, he had actually indicated that view very strongly to the, to the President, Johnson. And days afterwards, a couple of weeks afterwards, on November 1st, he actually sent in a memo recommending terms that would end the war. A coalition government with the communist-led National Liberation Front uh, elections, negotiating directly with the NLF for a ceasefire and for ending the war, and being and immediately ending all American bombing of the North. Uh, those were terms on which the war could have been settled in the fall of 1967. I didn't know he'd written that, actually in words drafted by my friend who was working for him, Mort Halpern, who later went on to work for Kissinger in the Republican administration. Uh, and he didn't, uh, hardly anybody knew that he was ready to recommend that to the president because he didn't tell. He kept the secret. Uh, it's shown in the Pentagon Papers what his memos were as early as May of that year, that essentially we should be ending the bombing and getting out. Had he been willing to talk then, I would say, and put out his own memos and the basis for them, essentially, he could have swung a Congress that was then very skeptical of the war, a democratically controlled Congress. But he didn't do that. Out of loyalty to the president, his conception of himself as a president's man, the possibility for later consulting or later being part of the establishment, like everyone else, he kept his mouth shut on his real views of what was happening in Vietnam. Just as I am certain at this moment, the Pentagon is filled with people who know that there is no ending of the war to be had on American terms in Afghanistan, and that it could go on another 16 years as it has now gone on, 16 years. The uh, situation, in other words, is very similar and for much the same reason. What I didn't fully understand until I read the Pentagon Papers myself, the early part was, this was an imperial war indistinguishable from the French neo-colonial war to regain conquest of their former colony uh, as of 1945 and 46 and later, that are supporting that war with first with money and arms and later with troops was simply a continuation of a war that the Vietnamese understood to be an imperial war from the beginning, in which the American role is essentially like that of the French. Not very different from the Soviets' invasion of Afghanistan, which we later emulated, despite total lack of success by the Soviets. They had no more success than the British Empire had had earlier in Afghanistan, or other empires going back to Genghis Khan and Alexander. Alexander. Likewise, we were fighting a country, the independence of a country, which as one Vietnamese friend of mine told me, is a country where we think of ourselves as having defeated the Chinese, although it took us a thousand years. When I heard that, I understood we were, we were on a different time scale. Uh, they were on a different time scale from, uh, from ours. But it was the beginning of understanding that we were in the feet 
uh, in the footsteps, I'm sorry, of the Chinese, the Japanese, the French, of course, in Indochina. There's no essential difference. And that remains true today in Afghanistan and elsewhere, where American national interests, as defined by a president, uh, alone, in secret, and not declared really uh, adequately or truthfully at all to the American public, is fighting against the independence of a country that is ready to fight for its independence. Not all of them. Some Vietnamese were on our side, as shown in the burns Novixen. They were the same Vietnamese, the same officials and the same uh, officers, and some of the same troops that had fought for the French against the independence of their country until we came in. There are, in short, collaborators, and I'm sure this is true in Afghanistan as well, or Iraq, who uh, are willing to fight for foreigners against their independence, uh, and for that matter, some of whom may have a sincere and even well-founded belief that what follows the foreigners will not be better for them. In other words, there were genuine anti-communists, largely Catholic, uh, in Vietnam, who were prepared to fight against the independence of their country and for a foreign power. But that did not make it a civil war. There's no civil war. Well, there are various conflicts going on in Afghanistan, but the war there now is a war for independence from a foreign occupier, invader. And in Vietnam, there were too many uh, Vietnamese prepared to fight against, again, against foreigners for us to have any form of success. Now, in October of 1967, I was among people who were, many of whom were obsessed as I was with ending this fruitless and as I came to realize, wrongful war. Many of them in the crowd understood that better than I did uh, in 67, but it's what I came to understand in 69 and 70. Had it not been for the example of the draft resistors, actually, who were burning draft cards in 67, but by 69, many of them, perhaps most of the 4,000 who went to prison, uh, were in prison at that point. And it was their example that made me realize that I should do more than I had yet done. What I had yet done was to tell my superiors in the Defense Department, just as McNamara was telling the president, but not the public and not Congress, uh, what the truth was about our situation there. Without the example of people who were ready to go to prison to make the strongest possible message to me and others that this was a wrong war, uh, that the posters shown rather condescendingly, uh, patronizingly and dismissively in the Burns Novick uh, movie of people saying, uh, we should get out. How many kids have you killed today, LBJ? Quite a fair question, actually, because LBJ was killing kids every day, and people under him were, were doing that. Uh, and he was not counting them, by the way. So the question, how many, was, was a good question, in fact. But they were right. The people in those protests were on the right side of the war issue in America. In Vietnam, we were the wrong side. It was not a civil war. Uh, it was a war entirely financed and promoted and directed uh, by foreigners. Uh, that's not a civil war. But we, as I say, we were the wrong side. The people who marched on the Pentagon knew that, believed that, and they were right. And a point I've just made, which is not so well known, is that the Secretary of Defense knew that, looking down in the window next to me, a few, a few windows away, that the crowd knew that, and was about to tell the president, for which he was fired immediately, kicked up to the World Bank and gotten out of the Pentagon, and actually replaced by a man, Clark Clifford, who also realized the war was hopeless and should be ended, and did what he could, including sacrificing his own relation to the president, as McNamara had, essentially. As Clifford told me later, uh, he didn't get a Christmas card from the president that year for the first time in decades, in fact. But in terms of going public and really launching a movement against the war, which either of them could have done, could have ended the war, uh, they didn't have the example 
of the graft resistors uh, directly under them to make them realize that they should do more than tell the truth in private to a president who was not prepared to respond to them. And of course, we have that situation now. I'm certain that uh, the Secretary of Defense, General Mattis, and the other generals, Dunluff, Dunford, Kelly, and others, must know that sending more advisors, as the president is about to do, sending more drones and air power, will not lead to an end of the war in Afghanistan or an end to the combat role. It's up to people who, like those who demonstrated in 65, 66, the years I was in Vietnam, 67, 68, 69, long went on, till 1975. And the American public, a large part of it, is part of that problem. They were willing to see the war go on rather than have a president admit defeat. As long as not too many Americans were getting killed and the number was going down as American troops went out. Um, I'm afraid that is where we are right now in Afghanistan. So the time, it's long past the time to spread the word the United States is an empire, a covert empire that depends on plausible denial that it is an empire or what it's doing or how many people its drones are killing, how many are being tortured now or whatnot. Getting the truth out doesn't have any guarantee of stopping the war, but it's necessary. And people who are ready to take, get arrested, to take the actions they were in October and later for the eight more years of the war uh, were an essential aspect. And in the end, the war did end. It was possible. It ended sooner than it would have uh, without their efforts. And that was worth their effort.